Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Hello, and good afternoon to our viewers here in the United States, and a very early morning welcome to those tuning in from Australia. I'm Charles Edel, a senior advisor and the inaugural holder of the Australia Chair here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C., an independent bipartisan think tank dedicated to finding the future of national security. President Biden recently declared that the United States has no closer or more reliable ally than Australia. I can tell you that interest here in Washington and Australia is sky high. Conversations across the administration, with members of Congress, with media, and with industry partners all underscore the amount of attention Australia is now getting. One of the reasons that alliance is so strong is because both the United States and Australia are vibrant democratic nations who share many interests and values. And I say that because Australia is a vibrant democracy that happens to be having an election coming up quite soon. To discuss those values, those interests, and the Australian election, I'm thrilled to welcome Senator Penny Wong. Penny Wong is a senator from South Australia and leader of the opposition in the Senate. She is shadow foreign minister, she is shadow minister, excuse me, for foreign affairs. She was first elected to the Senate in 2001. In 2013, she was appointed leader of the government in the Senate, and after the change of government, she was appointed the leader of the opposition in the Senate. Senator Wong is the first woman to hold both of those roles. It's a real honor to have her wake up so early and to join us here today. A uh, quick word on format. Senator Wong and I will discuss the Labor Party's approach to foreign policy and national security, Australia's evolving security environment, and the US-Australian alliance, among other topics. We'll do this for about 40 minutes or so, after which I'll pose some of your questions directly to Senator Wong. Now, if you're tuning in, on the webpage for this event, there's a form to submit questions. Uh, please do so, as they'll be fed into us, and we have a lot of ground to cover. So let me start with a real hard question. Uh, based on my time living in Australia, I can say that it was clear that every Australian politician needed to answer one question. Um, Senator Wong, what is your favorite ACDC song? Uh, well, to be honest, I wasn't really an ACDC fan. Um, I probably was more an NXS fan when I was younger. But, um, uh, uh, you know, I think Highway to Hell played at a lot of parties I went to when I was younger. But, you know, I, I'd, I'd suggest Don't Change from NXS is probably my, my, my song from that era. <laughs> okay, a, a dodge and an answer at the same time. Really useful. <laughs> On to the important uh, matters of this and the substance. And I promise them that they're all softballs after the NXS and uh, ACDC question. Um, as we look around us, we can see a world that's rapidly changing, obviously in Ukraine and Europe, but also in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I'd like us to start by taking a step back and getting your assessment of the evolving security environment and what that means for Australia. How do events in Ukraine and the upgraded relationship between Russia and China change your overall approach to Australia's foreign policy? Uh, look, that's a, a, you know, a central question of the times, but can I just start first by saying, Charles, what a pleasure it is to be here and to congratulate you and, and CSIS on having uh, you as the inaugural chair for, you know, inaugural Australia chair. It's a time where we really need to uh, add weight, uh, add uh, more granularity to our relationship given what's happening and, and this is a very welcome development so thanks for the opportunity. Well self-evidently we live in a much more risky, a much more dangerous world. Um, we no longer face theoretical threats. I wrote a couple of years ago that uh, Australia faced the most challenging strategic circumstances, external circumstances since the end of World War II and I think since I wrote that article things have only deteriorated. Uh, and we all know some of the drivers of that. Uh, it includes uh, China's much more aggressive posture. And essentially, we live in the, living in a period where our region is being reshaped and the global order is seeking to be reshaped. Uh, and we have to work out how we respond to that and how we deal with that. 
So Russia's decision to invade Ukraine, as, as all of uh, your viewers would know, you know, does represent a nation state determining to um, abrogate the commitments that the world gave each other. We all gave each other at the end of World War II to, to not invade or uh, to threat, not to threaten uh, or use force to compromise as territorial integrity or sovereignty. So we all, I think we all understand what this means for the post-World War II settlement and what that means for the environment uh, for all nations, as well as the tragedy that it is for the Ukrainian people, uh, and it is an immoral, unjust and illegal war. Uh, but you asked a really central question, which is the No Limits Partnership between uh, China and Russia, and, and that is a major strategic development and uh, uh, I think a, a very challenging uh, set of events for uh, the world, for the United States, for Australia, for uh, you know, all countries who have an interest, and I would argue every country has an interest uh, in stability and peace. Uh, we've been very deeply concerned by the implications of that. I'm sorry, that's the parliamentary bills being tested at 7, 7.05 a.m. Um, we've been very deeply concerned by some of uh, how that has been given effect in the context of Ukraine, uh, that it has led China to step away from its own precepts of foreign policy, which is the respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity. Um, and they've obviously sought, they've obviously compromised their position on those you know, decadal foreign policy positions as a consequence or as a result of the No Limits Partnership. Uh, so, you know, the departure from um, Communist Party foreign policy orthodoxies, which have been, has been a consequence of that limits partnership, I think uh, presages what, might, what may well come. I would make this point, I think has put, um, given China's, uh, given Russia's isolation and given um, you know, the uh, engagement in war crimes that Russia has engaged in, I do, do think it has um, really been problematic for China internationally, uh, and you see, have seen that in some of their some of their language and some of their um, behaviours. I think it is problematic when you're in a no limits partnership with with someone who is essentially an international pariah and is engaging in you know, the the sort of aggression on men, women, and children on hospitals and homes that uh, Mr. Putin is engaging in. Let me just follow up with that for a second, because as we're watching this rapidly evolving situation, um, I'm curious what lessons you are drawing from this, you know, for the world generally, uh, for the Indo-Pacific region more specifically, but for Australia especially, what are the lessons that we should be drawing out of what's happening now? Well, I think the first lesson is an analytical one, isn't it, which is the sort of theoretical proposition that we, you know, many have observed, which is uh, the global order and multilateralism being reshaped or fraying the pressures on uh, the, the world order that we have enjoyed, really, uh, since the end of World War II. I know I'm not suggesting there haven't been uh, conflicts and so forth, but it has been the most peaceful and prosperous period in human history. Uh, so, you know, what, what this demonstrates in, in, I suppose, in real time is the reality of that. Uh, what does it mean in terms of action? I think you, you wrote um, in a piece recently, Charles, that nation must, nations must act early and they must act in concert. And I think that really is the central lesson, actually, that if we are to uh, stand together to ensure uh, that our children uh, and their children inherit a region and a world in which sovereignty is respected, uh, a world where um, uh, there is peace, where uh, prosperity is enabled, where rules of the road, which is my shorthand way for you know, rules-based order, where the rules of the road are observed, you know, we can't be passive. Uh, and we also need to be intelligent and creative about how we bolster the rules of the road and the norms and principles that we want. Uh, and my view has been you, you don't bolster them, you don't buttress them 
simply by rhetoric and simply by uh, talking tough. Uh, we need, uh, particularly in, South, in, in Asia, um, in, in the Indo-Pacific, but particularly I would say in Southeast Asia and also in the uh, near Pacific, um, we, we need much deeper, uh, more aligned partnerships around um, shared interests and we need uh, to work, uh, I think, very conscientiously and creatively to uh, develop those. Uh, well, you've you've teed up uh, the rest of our questions right here, uh, because <laughs> one of the things that we should talk about, uh, you know, for Americans who are listening in, one of the things that they might not know is that uh, Australians pride themselves on being very bipartisan minded in terms of national security and foreign policy within limits. Uh, but we do have an election coming up and it's time to begin sharpening the differences about choice one versus choice two. And so one of the questions I think you have a lot of uh, viewers here in Washington, D.C. wondering is what does an, a, labor, a labor foreign policy agenda look like on day one? What stays the same? Uh, what changes and what looks mm. quite different? Uh, well, again, my apologies for the, the testing of the parliamentary bills, which is well timed, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> I, I hope you don't have to go vote at 7 No, 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 no. They just test them before people come in, but I'm here, obviously. Um, well, the first point I'd make is uh, there is a long tradition, as you have correctly identified, of bipartisanship around foreign policy in Australia. Uh, and the core of that uh, remains. So, you know, the bipartisan support for the US alliance, the bipartisan uh, support for um, uh, a defence budget at 2%, uh, bipartisan support for AUKUS, these are all things which are um, not in contest. So I do want to be very clear about that. Uh, now, obviously, there have been differences in emphases um, uh, historically, uh, probably historically, uh, um, we have, my party has been more focused on what used to be called Asia, but certainly Southeast Asia. Uh, we have a different view around climate change, uh, and that's probably the starkest difference. Uh, and, um, you know, we would, we also have a view that the government uh, has neglected some of the drivers of statecraft, some of the capability that's required to uh, navigate what is a much more challenging and risky world. So, you know, if, if I were foreign minister, I would be focusing in part on development assistance and diplomatic capability. But if I were to summarise it, what are the sort of three things that I would uh, want to prioritise in addition uh, to uh, those areas where there's bipartisanship? Firstly, projecting the reality of modern Australia. I think we can uh, do a far better job in the region projecting who we are. We're a multicultural nation. Uh, we have uh, an extraordinary First Nations heritage, uh, uh, which I think can, could contribute substantially to building our relationships and soft power in the region, including through international broadcasting. I would want stronger trusted partnerships. We've already announced a high level Southeast Asian envoy. Uh, and thirdly, as I said, capability. Like we, we, we need to improve our capability. If I could take a step back, um, what I'd say to you is, you know, what are the purposes of foreign policy? You have to advance Australia's interests and values. You have to ensure our security. You have to ensure our economic strength and you have to shape the world for the better. And you need to do it at a time. We need to do it at a time which, as you and I have identified, our world is being reshaped. So my view is this generation of leaders and you know, thought leaders as well as political leaders we have a responsibility to influence that reshaping. And the question is, how do we most do that? Um, all right, uh, again, uh, this is a, a great conversation where you've laid a, a lot of groundwork. And so that I understand, uh, I just wanna, you said that the um, uh, the Alliance, the 2% uh, kind of uh, budget as a floor uh, and all this are off the table because those are all likely areas of continuity. Uh, Correct. Okay. Um, and I think, and and more, uh, and as importantly, because this is a in part of, uh, as importantly, there is uh, a great de uh, degree of bipartisanship on the assessment of the challenges China poses. Yes. Um, and 
I want to dig into where we see the uh, Australian-American relationship mm -hmm. going first, uh, because we've seen rapid movement, not only bilaterally over the last couple of years, but uh, trilaterally, uh, we could say with AUKUS, but also with the Japanese, uh, quadrilaterally uh, with both the Japanese and the Indians as well. But uh, starting with just that bilateral core, uh, where do you see the relationship developing? What types of obstacles is it likely to face? And where would you like to see it go from here? Mm. First, just again, to be clear, this is our most important relationship. Uh, and uh, it, it is, uh, has always been important. Uh, and I would, uh, I would say it's uh, probably uh, even, even uh, you know, after 70 years, uh, it's entering a phase of even greater importance and uh, the the centrality of the this strategic relationship and our alliance uh, i was pleased to uh, reinforce uh, labor's views on that when uh, the leader anthony albanese and i met with secretary blinken and ambassador campbell uh, prior to the quad ministers foreign ministers meeting last month um, uh, if i could just make this point you know the United States remains the indispensable nation. However, the, the, the nature of that indispensability has changed. Obviously, the, what, what it now means is uh, that other nations need to work uh, together uh, uh, with the US uh, to ensure that the reshaping of the region and the world that we are seeing uh, is in accordance with our collective interests. Um, uh, now, uh, in terms of the alliance, I think one thing that would change uh, is you would see from a Labor government, were we to have the privilege of being elected, a much stronger position on climate. Uh, and I'd make a couple of points about that. Uh, first, obviously, climate change uh, is a, a real and is a present reality. Uh, and we have we have to uh, continue to steer the world towards the objectives that the majority of the world has uh, articulated, which is net zero by 2050, but also near-term action. Uh, I would make a, a strategic point and a, a, about climate change, though. Uh, and I, I, you know, I speak to you at a time where we we here in Australia have seen Solomon Islands a, a draft. Uh, arrangement between China and Solomon Islands uh, hit the media, uh, not as yet official, but it does demonstrate a very concerning development. It is very important to recognise that for uh, Pacific Island nations, regardless of their political perspective, so there's not a sort of, I always forget the terms in the US because you use liberal in a different way, but conservative liberal uh, <laughs> divide on this issue. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> this is a this is a lived reality for Pacific Island nations. When 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 in the I think it was the the, the a recent a declaration a few years ago, the Bow Declaration. When they then when those leaders said climate change is our number one national security issue, we needed to listen. So I I do believe uh, that. Uh, a more forward-leaning position from an Australian government on climate. It's not only the right thing to do from Australia's you know, national interests, uh, it also is the right thing to do in terms of our engagement with Pacific Island nations who uh, have been calling for years under the current government for us to uh, do better both domestically but also how we operate internationally. Uh, I'm going to return to Solomon Islands because it's been all over the news and I've gotten a lot of mm. questions uh, on that. But, you know, staying on what would be different uh, in the U.S.-Australian alliance if Labor uh, assumes government um, in May, can you give you, your viewers here in Washington a sense of uh, what should Australia expect from the U.S. politically, diplomatically, militarily? Um, what is the expectation from Canberra um, under under a Labor government, but in general too? What are the expectations on the U.S. at this point? 
the the single priority that I'd like to emphasize uh, is uh, when the US looks to consistent and constructive engagement in the region, which is what we all want, uh, a critical piece is the as an economic strategy. Uh, and I emphasize that because uh, if we look to particularly the countries of Southeast Asia, but the, the region more broadly, uh, you know, they are developing countries that have a, a set of interests uh, around development and economic prosperity. Uh, and in the context of China being the, the number one trading partner for the majority of the region, uh, it is, uh, we, we are, it is critical as we approach this regional reshaping uh, that there is a demonstration of uh, the economic interests that nation have, nations have as well uh, through you know, the United States engagement in the region. So the one message I, I give every American uh, that I, I meet is it's, it's really critical that there is a, an economic strategy for our region. Um, certainly from Australia's perspective, obviously, uh, you know, we can do better as well in terms of diversifying our export markets and what we export. So, summary, the US is indispensable in our region. There is, um, you know, as the region is being reshaped, uh, the US is critical to underpinning uh, the direction of that reshaping and the architecture of that reshaping. To, uh, for, secondly, uh, to do that. Uh, that is not a, just a bilateral point, that's a regional point. So what I would want uh, is us to continue to work together, not just as bilateral partners around uh, strategic issues, uh, but within the region uh, around strategic and economic issues. Uh, well, uh, first of all, let me just uh, tip my hat to your lovely reference to uh, Madeleine Albright's uh, discussion of the US as the indispensable partner now that we've just uh, lost uh, her over right. here. But I think the agenda that you're teeing up, uh, a climate agenda under a labor government and how that would have both climate and strategic effect, um, an economic, a more proactive economic plan. Uh, one thing you hear consistently from the Australian embassy is the United States needs to get in the game better on the economic space and also making sure that that bilateral alliance goes beyond Australia and the US into the region. I, I wanna stick though with one more element of the bilateral relationship before we leave it behind, which is uh, you know, with our defense posture review, uh, with the defense budget that was submitted just hours ago from the administration to the Congress, there's been a lot of talk about an increased, more permanent US military presence in Australia beyond the, mar uh, the Marine detachment up in Darwin. Uh, and I'd like to hear your ideas about uh, whether or not you see that being a good idea uh, and what principles should really guide the expansion of the US presence in Australia. Uh, well, look, I haven't seen obviously what's gone to Congress today. That, that's, that, that's breaking news for me. So that's, um, uh, look, Bob Hawke, a former Australian Prime Minister, talked about um, coined the term self-reliant within the alliance. Uh, and that is, I suppose, the lodestar of Labor's approach. Uh, and also, I, I would, if I if I could venture, also uh, an observation that the Americans, um, both sides of the aisle, would make to us. You know, that that you know we have to be partners. Obviously, we're a smaller partner. Uh, when I was a member of the cabinet under the Gillard government, we we established the rotation of Marines through Darwin. I think that was a good thing, uh, and. Uh, as I, uh, as you and I both reference, obviously the Labor Party has delivered bipartisan support for the AUKUS agreement, uh, and you know that that's obviously had um, you know, broad support across the political spectrum, and that's a good thing. We want to take that out of uh, partisan uh, contest. I mean, that, I probably won't get into hypotheticals about what might or might not happen, but do I think that? deepening our strategic relationship is a good thing. Yes, I do. Um, you know, it's uh, I won't push you on this one, but I will note that, uh, as I say to everyone here in Washington, 
some of the details about where we might go are hiding in plain sight. And all you have to do is Google uh, the Osman deliverables of this past year when we begin to talk about what an expanded footprint might begin to look like. Although we've not necessarily answered the question here of what circumstances might prompt that. Um, you have teed us up really well on the Solomon Islands. I have to tell you, I feel like shades of Vanuatu all over again. Uh, you know, we were living uh, in Sydney uh, when the Vanuatu story broke. For those of you who are not familiar with the Vanuatu story, there was uh, stories that broke in the news that uh, the Chinese were in discussions for setting up a dual use facility in Vanuatu right on the northern approaches uh, to Australia. And you had uh, the government, you had labor, uh, yourself, you had New Zealand even saying uh, that this would be antithetical to the interests of all nations concerned. Uh, because as you have laid out, I think very well in the opening comments, uh, this creates, begins to create a situation that looks, if not existential, very similar to what it did six or seven decades ago. All right, that's my kind of overarching statement. I wanna get a little more specific about the news that we've been watching play out over the last couple of days in the Solomon Islands. And we know that there's going to be a speech later today by the prime minister up there. Uh, I'd like to get your assessment about why you think the Solomons are proceeding uh, with what looks to be basing and transit rights for Beijing. Uh, and, uh, you know, easy questions for you, but I'd also like to know, how do you think uh, a labor government would respond to this? You've talked about having a climate agenda, but this challenge of contesting, uh, expanding Chinese influence and access and military presence in the Pacific, would be keen to hear your thoughts on that one. Well, first, you know, I always preface, I would always preface my remarks about uh, Pacific Island nations um, decisions to say, you know, obviously countries have the right to make their own security arrangements. Uh, and second, I would make this point, which is if you look historically, including at Solomon Islands, where Australia had a presence for many, many years, the Pacific family has been capable of delivering security arrangements for, for each other. Uh, and uh, what we would uh, continue to articulate from an Australian government's perspective uh, with other Pacific Island nations, and I think that's critical, um, is that that Pacific family of which we are a part, but others are a part, um, uh, has always been able to look after itself uh, together uh, and that approach should continue. Uh, and a development which introduces a sharper edge of strategic competition into that region, uh, what I would say is not in the interests of other Pacific Island nations. More broadly, this is a reminder uh, in many ways of the point I made earlier about economic engagement in the region. Uh, if, you're going, if we're going to uh, have um, deep trusting partnerships, uh, we, we have to approach those relationships with consistency, uh, with integrity, uh, and demonstrating that we are engaging because we do care about the interests of those nations uh, and we see alignment uh, in those interests, uh, not just a, a sort of frame of strategic competition. Because if you're a, a leader of a developing nation which is struggling to deal with the effects of climate change, the economic effects of COVID and so forth, you, know, you obviously have a, a range of objectives that you and responsibilities that you have. So I think it is very important that we engage uh, on this issue, not only with Solomon Islands, but with other nations in the Pacific uh, region. I don't want to, for your audience, uh, to step away from underscoring just how serious a development this is. Uh, this is uh, a deeply troubling uh, development from Australia's perspective and from the US's perspective. I want to stay on the framing point that you brought up because I think it's a really important one uh, about how we talk about things matters. Uh, rhetoric isn't the only thing matters, 
but rhetoric is the way that we begin to orient our policies and therefore resources too. Uh, in the past, I know that labor has been somewhat reluctant to enter into framing uh, the competition that we see in ideological terms as an ideological mm -hmm. competition between a democratic and authoritarian powers. Um, you know, at the top of our conversation, Senator Wong, you discussed the no limits friendship. Uh, it is mm -hmm. a, a relationship between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin that knows no limits. Uh, so we're told three weeks before the invasion of Ukraine. And I'd like to hear uh, your thoughts about whether or not you think we're heading into an era that is increasingly defined by ideological contest and what that might mean. Well, ideology always you know, has a role to play, uh, but I suppose I come from a school which says you, you look to nation's interests to try and understand why something is happening. Uh, and you also um, try to assess your own interests and values um, uh, when determining your foreign policy, which is the purpose of foreign policy to advance your interests and values. Uh, so I don't, I think there is an ideological element. Uh, uh, you know, there is obviously a convergence of views, interests and values between you know, two essentially authoritarian nations uh, against um, you know, the, the liberal democratic values which really underpin uh, our current international, our current world order. But <clears throat> I simply, the point I make uh, is a very pragmatic one. Uh, uh, when it comes from, in, in part, you know, to the recognition that the region in which we live um, you know, has a range of different government and political systems and, and a range of different cultures. Uh, so if we are going to engage uh, in the way we need to, um, whether or not putting it entirely in a, a sort of ideological frame is the most effective way. Uh, if we think about this as a Venn diagram, <laughs> all right, so um, you know, we share with many nations that don't share our liberal democratic um, character, but we share with, uh, with many nations in our region uh, who have different sort of views about democracy or different versions of democracy. We, we share an interest in a region which is not hegemonic. We share an interest in a region where there are rules on the road, where outcomes in terms of uh, maritime law or trade are not determined by power alone. And we share those interests regardless of whatever ideological difference we have. So we should never step, we should always be advancing our values. We should, all, we should never step away from them. But I make a pragmatic point about how you articulate the challenge in a way that most engenders alignment. Uh, and the alignment of interest seems to me to be uh, really the, the key objective in terms of how we we, we articulate those those issues. Uh, I, I won't ask for your opinions on Venn diagrams. I, I try to leave those uh, behind, but I am really interested about this framing, right? As both a, as you have put out uh, a policy uh, frame for how we proceed smartly, uh, but also one that is of course political. Uh, how do we call on ourselves uh, as democratic societies to put forth the efforts that we need, uh, both in resources, but also potential sacrifices that we're willing to make. And uh, I, I'm curious if framing it um, not as a contest uh, between democratic authoritarian powers, if you think that allows the requisite amount of resources to be called forth from oh, well. our public. Look, uh, I, I think the Australian community hmm. uh, absolutely understands uh, what what we're living through. So when, when we talk about the reshaping of the region, uh, when we talk about um, what's happening in Ukraine, when we talk about China under President Xi Jinping becoming much more aggressive, um, our people understand that the nation is called to act. So I, I don't, I, you know, from a domestic political perspective, I don't think um, you know, there's people are very clear about 
what's required to advance and protect Australian interests and values at this time. And we've been the subject of economic coercion as a consequence of a set of decisions, many of which, well, all of which really were bipartisan. I was part of the government which excluded, um, which didn't allow Huawei to build our national broadband network. Um, you know, we opposed the China extradition treaty. Um, we supported the government on the exclusion of Huawei on 5G. Uh, we, you know, the, all of these and many other issues, uh, uh, you know, have contributed to um, the situation, the bilateral relationship, which Australians are aware of. So, I don't, I don't think, from our domestic political perspective, and obviously, you know, we're not the the world's superpower, so it, <laughs> uh, it there's a, a sort of different set of imperatives. I think people understand you know, we're living in a time of great change, uh, and the task is how do we maximise Australia's power and influence at this time. You know, it's, uh, I want to take us like to a land before time, or at least before the pandemic, uh, because I'll say that, uh, you know, if we can even remember that far back, uh, but your point is really well uh, taken that uh, when I would have great strategic conversations uh, with other think tank analysts, with government officials, with elected officials, I'd say that these were not conversations that were totally removed from the conversations that I would have in the pub and with my neighbors. Uh, I thought there was a fair amount of tracking, uh, at least in broad stroke, uh, about these issues and a real hunger uh, from people under, to know what was happening and what could be done about it. Um, you know, I want to pick up on something that you had said uh, about bipartisan. Can I, just, yeah. Okay, can I just come back to one point, which I, I should have made in the previous answer, which you would be aware of. It's very instructive, isn't it, that the leaders, key leaders in Southeast Asia, um, Prime Minister Lee, I think a couple of years ago and others since, uh, made very clear to, um, uh, in public statements, um, that Southeast Asia doesn't want to be asked to choose in terms of the, str the strategic competition. Uh, and I noticed the, the language from Secretary Blinken and, and Ambassador Campbell, you know, and, and others, I think the Secretary of Defence um, most recently, that, that we need to frame um, what is happening very much in the context of what sort of region do you want to live in uh, and um, make sure uh, that those areas where there is, you don't like the Venn diagram, but where there is, a, a, you know, a, where interests align, law of the sea, which is the South China Sea point, um, uh, in WTO or trade relationships, which is an economic coercion point, that we work, we maximise um, the alignment on those issues in terms which really makes sense uh, if you consider where those nations are. Um, on I'm sorry, I took you off track, Charles. No, it's fine. We can go We can go on multiple tracks here at once because we really are covering a broad uh, yeah. topic here. One of the things that you had said is, look, on core issues, there there is some variation that's good and that's healthy, but there has been a fair amount of bipartisanship be it on AUKUS, be it on the Quad, be it on foreign interference and BRI, be it on technology uh, infrastructure, you talked about Huawei. Yep. Uh, but one area uh, where you have been particularly critical uh, of the government is uh, comments uh, from Minister Dutton uh, when he said it would be inconceivable that Australia would not join the US in a future war over Taiwan. Um, you don't have to respond uh, to his comments. You guys have already hashed that out, but I'm curious about what you make about the counter argument that strategic ambiguity is less useful than it was in the past and that moving away from that has value. Um, I'm really curious how you think about the increasing problem sets that we have dealing with uh, Taiwan here and what's likely to be helpful. Uh, I'd make this point. <clears throat> um, a conflict in the Taiwan Straits has a 
the potential to be catastrophic, not just for the region, but for the world. So let's understand the context in which we're, we're, we're dealing. The second point I'd make is this is not an abstract theoretical discussion that leaders should engage in. So I have no difficulty in people from CSIS and others having, a, I suppose, a theoretical argument or a, a, a discussion about um, the utility or otherwise of strategic ambiguity, but it is a different thing for leaders to start shifting position. Uh, and my concern about Mr Dutton doing that was, I think that was not a strategic shift, but a um, rhetorical shift driven by domestic uh, objectives. And I would note that it was not language echoed by the Prime Minister or the Foreign Minister. Uh, so my observation about, I suppose, red lines is we, uh, let's not articulate them unless um, there is a very clear decision to do that. Uh, thank you for the clarity on that. Um, you know, on Taiwan, one of the most challenging sets that we're trying to deal with and trying to think through is how we actually get to a firmer footing on deterrence issues. Mm. Um, this is one that uh, was ripe and rampant in every conversation I had in Australia and every conversation we are having now in Washington, DC. And I'm curious how uh, a country like Australia uh, begins to think about deterrence. Is it willing to fund it uh, and fund beyond where we are right now, given the other priorities, uh, that a democratic polity wants to make, such as health, uh, climate initiatives, uh, when we see that the balance of power in the region has shifted dramatically? There's a number of points in that question, but I'll just deal with the last bit, which is the consequence of the strategic environment in which we find ourselves. And yes, uh, the hard reality is uh, at a time where uh, we, you know, we have you know, some fiscal challenges, obviously, because of COVID. Um, and um, I, would, I would argue because of the, the previous uh, terms of this government where uh, debt has increased, uh, we, we face a, a, a period where inevitably whoever's in government is going to have to spend more on defence. Um, but that is, and that, that, you know, I'm the former finance minister, so, the consequence of that is less expenditure on on other areas, and that is a that's a hard decision to make. But I think it's the decision that uh, has been made by both parties of government. How useful is it? So one of the things that I find really interesting uh, when I'm asked about Australia here, uh, mm. meaning of course I speak with the wrong accent. I'm just doing my best to translate. Uh, is that Australia has been a fascinating example uh, about in a time of austere budgets, in a time of the pandemic, a recognition of a changed security environment and mm. the defense decisions that need to flow from that. Mm. I'm curious if you can, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about in your conversations outside of Australia, uh, in the region, uh, but then beyond, how much this message resonates. Uh, that is, we have a dramatically shifted security environment and therefore policy needs to radically change along with budgets, as you've said. Is that a message that has any purchase beyond Australia, the United States, Japan, and a couple of others? Mm. Uh, well, and you know, those are important nations <laughs> to, to have, to have uh, in, the same, in the same place, but, this really comes back to the discussion about partnerships and alignment that we had earlier. Um, when you're engaging with other nations, with other countries and other leaders or uh, across the spectrum, you have to have a very good sense of where they are, not just where you are. Uh, and I would make this point, we should not underestimate the extraordinary challenges that particularly the nations of Southeast Asia, but also Pacific Island nations, but if I could focus for a moment on Southeast Asian nations, the enormous challenges they face. I mean, they go into the pandemic uh, uh, in, in 
to vary, vary with varying degrees of economic um, resilience uh, uh, at different points in terms of economic development. Uh, a pandemic which is a global economic shock on top of, uh, um, uh, you know, the, many of them don't have um, the same sort of public health systems that, for example, we, we, we have here in Australia. Uh, and so leaders, not just the leader, but you know, political community leaders are struggling with multiple challenges. So in part, the, uh, what we have to do and we should do is do better across the multiplicity of those challenges, whether it's in terms of vaccine rollout, um, assistance in primary care, um, their, you know, their primary care ar architecture, uh, as well as um, you know, broader economic issues, hence my discussion about economic strategy uh, for US engagement in the region. Uh, we have to recognise the, the plethora of challenges that these nations are facing, uh, because if we only have a strategic competition discussion, it's very easy for uh, nations to not feel that we understand and share understand and share their objectives for greater prosperity and economic resilience for their people. A uh, point well taken. You can really see the shift uh, that's uh, uh, coming out of Washington to meet that mm -hmm. demand. I think over the past I think so. year plus that uh, we had no affirmative agenda. That's what the Quad is now intended to do. At least in the public space, that is an yes, and I should have I should have mentioned that. I mean, I do think. I mean, there are implementation questions that we all have to take responsibility for, particularly you know, obviously, whoever's in government. But the the quad shifting to you know, including the vac vaccine rollout, for example, as part of its agenda, I think that is a positive move. Absolutely, uh, you know, staying on Southeast Asia, which you've mentioned several different times. Uh, you know, for years, Australian policymakers have really talked about closer economic and political relations with the nations of ASEAN, especially mm. always underscoring Indonesia, uh, your near mm. neighbor, a country whose security, uh, stability and well-being matters more than almost any other country uh, to Australia. I, I'm curious if that's still a goal and a priority focus of labor's and what you would do uh, if in government that's different from past governments uh, for the region, but specifically on Indonesia too. Yes, well, uh, you know, you're you're correct to identify um, the position Indonesia has for us. Um, I mean, all of the Southeast Asian nations and ASEAN as entity uh, are important because uh, they. You know, we live in this region uh, and the stability of those nations and the stability of ASEAN as an entity matters to us in very direct terms. Uh, but the, the central nation, um, in part for, because of its size, in part because of its location um, for Australia within Southeast Asia, obviously historically has been uh, Indonesia, I'm from Malaysia, so you know, I think um, originally. So, you know, obviously there are many other nations in Southeast Asia which we would want to deepen our relationship with. But Indonesia has, for Australian foreign policy makers, been central. Uh, and uh, I, I think that is an example of a nation where um, the kind of broader uh, approach that recognises what President Jokowi and, and you know, his his colleagues are grappling with uh, is is necessary. Um, unfortunately, we went into the pandemic with the government having cut development assistance to Indonesia uh, uh, in terms of um, support for health, uh, which you know in hindsight was a very <laughs> unwise decision. Um, we have said we will increase development assistance obviously they're given the discussion about defense in our fiscal circumstances uh, will mean we can't do that overnight um, we've already announced um, a, a, a climate infrastructure partnership with indonesia uh, the, the mr albanese the leader of the labor party announced that a few weeks ago now uh, and the logic of that is to recognize the importance of trying to work with Indonesia to increase its climate resilience. 
um, you know, given its geography, uh, you know, as an archipelago, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, and its, um, uh, I suppose, vulnerability to some of the consequences and effects of climate change. Uh, thanks. Uh, you know, right before I left uh, from Australia, you and I uh, were seated next to each other at a dinner, if you remember. Uh, You've got a good memory. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you were uh, beating up on me. Not really, just we were having a great conversation. That's about, harsh. That's uh, harsh. It's it's just Australians are frank, aren't we? I think Americans are more polite often. <laughs> New Yorkers are also frank, so you're in good company. Okay, we're okay. Uh, but one of the questions <laughs> that you put to me, uh, I'm hearing, you know, your, your articulated thoughts on about whether or not we could develop a smarter policy for Southeast Asia. Um, one of the most challenging areas to develop a smarter policy on is pushing back against economic coercion. Mm -hmm. I've, I've gotten a lot of questions uh, on this uh, in the queue. Uh, Matt Trader at IRI uh, asked this particular one, but this is an obvious problem. You've already alluded to the fact that most Australians, all Australians probably are cognizant of the economic hammer coming down on Australia across so many different sectors. Um, and yet, the answers that we have beyond market mechanisms, uh, i.e. diversify who you sell to, um, have not been as forthcoming as we all might like. And I'm curious to hear a little bit more uh, of your thinking about what type of collective responses should there be from Australia's partners, not just the US, to help make sure that smaller countries uh, like Australia, but also like Estonia, can conduct trade uh, with China without fear of capricious economic coercion? Uh, I'm not sure, frankly, this is a challenging question. Now, I'm not sure we have a good set of policies yet to address what is a clear challenge in front of us. Yeah, well, uh, I think the world is grappling with how to deal with a nation that uh, has been very clear about um, its willingness to integrate economic and strategic objectives. So if I just step back for a minute, if you think about Prime Minister Howard, uh, who would probably be still known to your um, um, participants, uh, you know, he used to speak explicitly about uh, you know, the two domains in terms of Australia's relationships with China and the US, so our strategic relationship with the United States and our, you know, uh, uh, the largest economic relationship, not in investment terms, but in terms of trade um, with, with China. Um, and that model served Australia pretty well. Um, uh, you know, China obviously uh, was pretty hungry for our commodities. Uh, we, we uh, there was a a set of economic interests which overlap between China and the United and, and Australia uh, for many years under um, uh, Mr. Howard's government uh, and under our government to some extent, uh, which continued. We, we don't live in that world anymore. We live in a, a very different world where the, the distinction between the strategic and the economic uh, is, is really no longer apposite. Uh, and uh, all nations, uh, for obviously like-minded nations, uh, but all nations will need to grapple with this because it represents a very substantial shift from the way in which um, international trading arrangements uh, have operated under the multilateral system, uh, you know, over the decades uh, through its various iterations, GATT, WTO, etc., since the end of World War II. So we all have to work together to work out how we deal with that. Now, in part, it is... Uh, are sh uh, reinforcing, uh, perhaps improving the architecture of our in trading arrangements. In part, it is uh, you know, being clear about um, the, in terms of the TPP, the comprehensive, um, the, C the CPTPP, it's such a difficult acronym, that one, um, <clears throat> uh, which um, you know, obviously sets important standards and obligations on parties. But in part, there is a collective assertion of the necessity of all powers 
complying with their own international obligations, honouring their own international obligations. Uh, and all that is very difficult. <laughs> uh, I would also say from a, you, you sort of reference diversifying your export markets. I mean, I think there is a, a parallel but related uh, set of questions about economic resilience for Australia. Uh, and they involve not just diversifying export markets, but diversifying what we export. Uh, because uh, what you export is as important to your market diversity as um, just simply your export markets. So there is a, an economic transformation point, which we are very serious about uh, uh, if we were to be elected. We see an opportunity post the pandemic uh, to really focus on targeted industry policy to develop uh, those jobs and industries which enable that diversification. And I would make the point that climate is really important here from our perspective. I see that as a real driver of economic transformation. Um, uh, and you know, I think those are... And the second point on that front is supply chain resilience, which has been, I know, a subject discussed in the United States as well. I think that the economic shock of the pandemic uh, combined with uh, some of these other strategic issues have reminded us of some of the fragility of global supply chains and uh, the importance oops, sorry um, the importance of making sure that um, uh, in key areas you can't make everything in Australia we're, we're not that big but in key areas where we have a greater resilience for in terms of economic uh, in terms of our supply chains uh, thanks for beginning to take on such a really large question that we're grappling with. Uh, I, I remember in uh, summer, which means your winter, uh, 2019, uh, having written a report uh, with uh, John Lee, a colleague in Australia, about the future we're heading towards. Uh, one, by the way, which none of us upon ourselves, but which inevitably we seem to be moving towards, uh, we have exited uh, the era of unfettered geoeconomics, and we are rapidly moving into one geopolitics trumps geoeconomics. And uh, no matter how many businesses I wanted to talk to about this, uh, I was told it's okay, we're not there yet. And yet, as we saw over the year that followed that, under duress, Australian businesses and exporters were indeed able to scramble uh, and find new markets. But as you had said, uh, under duress is not how we do strategic planning for either governments or for businesses as we move forward. But it's also an opportunity, isn't it? It is. Like, like uh, yes, you're right. I mean, we always would prefer to be strategic rather than reactive. But sometimes shocks, disruption uh, can generate innovation creativity and insight. And I think that uh, if we we uh, take the right lessons from both the pandemic and what we have seen in terms of our trade um, challenges, uh, then we could, from Australia's perspective, we could really set the country up for a much more economic resilient path over the next decades. And that's certainly our objective. No, I really, uh, I take your point. Shocks have the uh, opportunity not only to shock us, but to generate unseen and un, uh, impossible previous opportunities. Uh, look, I, I'm really appreciative of all the time that you've spent with us. I just wanted to ask you one uh, final question here, because I know it's one that you've thought a lot about. Uh, and you've uh, mentioned uh, the importance of retaining our own democratic character, uh, the fact that Australia, like the United States, is a multicultural society. and one of the real challenges uh, I think that both of our countries face is balancing dealing with rising authoritarianism and democratic backsliding in our own regions while maintaining social cohesion and accepting immigrants from countries into places like Australia and the United States. Uh, it's, we can't just wish away some of the challenges that we have here. And I'm curious, how do you think about getting that balance right to make sure that we are protecting people who come into our countries who are ethnic minorities? Uh, it's a very good question. And it reminds us of the responsibility of leaders and that words matter. Uh, and 
uh, I, I can tell you that the Chinese Australian community in Australia has found some of the ways in which this has been debated domestically very challenging. Uh, I would step back and say again, from Australia's perspective, and I think it's the same for the United States, uh, what we see our diversity uh, as a strength. Uh, we see uh, the, the fact, like the United States, that we have people from all over this world who've come to Australia uh, and built uh, a life here, brought all of their um, heritage and culture and entrepreneurialism uh, and energy to this country is a great strength. And that and our First Nations people uh, are, are integral to Australia's character uh, and uh, Australian, the reality of modern Australia. Uh, and I think leaders always have to be very careful about the consequences of their rhetoric, uh, responsible and careful, and to always seek to unite rather than to divide. Uh, and the tradition of my party um, if you look at it over decades, has been that we do believe we are much stronger united uh, than we are divided. Uh, what a uh, what an important note uh, to close on, and I just really do want to take a, a second to thank you for yes, waking up early, for, but for really <laughs> kind of spanning the uh, the waterline. That was a, an awful lot of issues, but for your American audience, for sure, this is a really um, a well articulated view of how labor sees the challenges, uh, where it might go forward if it indeed wins the election. So I'd really like to thank you for taking the time, your staff as well, uh, I'm sure who are having a lot of fun prepping this, but on our end to the CSIS staff for uh, making sure that this went off uh, so well. So look forward to seeing you next time I'm there or next time you come to visit uh, CSIS. Uh, for those of you who are watching, as we stand up the Australia chair here, uh, please stay tuned for a, a ton more of programming uh, in this space. So again, uh, before I sign off, just Senator Wong, thank you very much for your time here. Thank you. It's been it's been very interesting and very enjoyable. I've much appreciated it. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.